This is Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our web address is libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org. Today we are discussing with Donald Devine his new book, America's Way Back, Reclaiming Freedom, Tradition, and the Constitution. Donald Devine is vice chairman of the American Conservative Union and is a senior scholar at the Fund for American Studies, and he is the author of seven other books. He was a longtime advisor to Ronald Reagan and served as head of the Federal Civil Service during Reagan's first term. Donald, glad to have you on the program. Well, thank you for having me, Richard. Great to be here. Donald, you begin the book, America's Way Back, and you know, the title, um, uh, I think, indicates this. Uh, arguing or describing America uh, as a country existing in a state of crisis. What, what do you think is really the fundamental uh, root of, of that crisis, if, if I've read you accurately? Well, uh, the fundamental uh, root of it, I'm afraid, uh, came from uh, another philosophy uh, from what our government was based on. Uh, uh, the U.S. Constitution is kind of the shining light uh, of what uh, made America great to me. Uh, and the rise of progressivism in the late 19th century specifically aimed at the Constitution as the problem uh, uh, underlying America uh, at that time, uh, which they said was the inability to get high goals accomplished. Uh, uh, very brilliant young scholar went to Europe uh, and he saw uh, Prussia and he said, hey, uh, Prussia works. It's the modern way, as did most of Europe at the time. Uh, when the Chancellor and the Kaiser decided something was going to be done, uh, it got done. And look what they accomplished. They set up a, a great welfare system, a social security system for old age, uh, uh, comprehensive health coverage, uh, guaranteed education, uh, and required education of everyone. Uh, they created the perfect welfare state, uh, and that young man came back and wrote a book uh, that's still in circulation, uh, uh, and he blamed directly the problem with America, he said, is they separate power rather than uh, bringing it together. Uh, they said uh, the U.S. Uh, can't get anything done. So that has been the conservative, the progressive plan uh, uh, almost the last century uh, with some uh, ups and downs. Uh, but that uh, is how we got in the present uh, situation. Uh, and I would argue that the uh, situation uh, is economic, uh, because uh, it, it takes away individual responsibility. Uh, uh, it's governmental because it puts too much power that can't be used effectively uh, at the national level. Um, and morally, uh, the whole system is based on uh, uh, Western civilization, uh, is based on individuals doing things and free groups doing things. Uh, uh, if you look at what uh, the great social analyst, the Tocqueville, <coughs> said when he he looked at America, uh, that's exactly what he said would happen over time. That great vitality of individuals and groups and <coughs> and locals uh, would be dissipated uh, as power got uh, more and more centralized, as it would tend to do under a democratic government. So. Okay. It's probably a long answer, but that's... <laughs> no, <laughs> let me... You, you said, uh, you said a, a, a young man. A young man went to Europe. You're referring to Woodrow Wilson, uh, I assume there, and also referring to uh, the argument he makes uh, that our founders had erred by trying to divide power and separate power uh, because they had not actually made it accountable, uh, that a, a powerful executive would be immediately accountable, but he would also be able to... Uh, fundamentally, <laughs> to transform America and to make great change. Yeah, well, he, he thought he'd be accountable, but he assumed that it would be accountable by uh, an effective bureaucratic system. One of the things 
I point out is how <coughs> not so long ago, again, roughly the beginning of the 20th century, uh, all the intellectuals uh, uh, thought that uh, bringing power together uh, under a bureaucracy was the way to solve problems. Bureaucracy used to be the great salvation word. Now, today, bureaucracy immediately gives negative connotations. Uh, nobody really has faith in this system anymore. Uh, <coughs> it goes on mainly simply because uh, 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 of status. It, it just uh, <coughs> goes along of its own power. Nobody likes it or thinks Nobody really thinks bureaucracy is going to solve all of society's problem anymore, and yet we keep giving it more power. Yeah, no, I, I wanted to ask you. I mean, we think about uh, we think about Obamacare. I mean, that's obviously the largest uh, piece of legislation uh, that's being discussed in the news, part of his presidency. Also, we've got the Dodd Frank Act, and and I was going to ask you. No one really seems to believe in this. No one thinks the Dodd Frank Act is going to make the financial system less subject to a systemic uh, financial crisis. In fact, a lot of people are saying it's going to make it you know, more susceptible to that and, and actually contemplates it and just tries to regulate it and codify some sort of, some sort of financial breakdown. Also, we've got with, with Obamacare, uh, so many different huge regulatory pieces. Of course, we've got daily, you know, just the, the failure of that legislation to, to do what it said it would do in terms of affordable health care that, that people would want to buy. But also we've got you know, the, the belief that you could take uh, prices, practices in one part of the country that are cost efficient and then magically transform or transfer those uh, to another part of the medical industry. And I think that's a huge part of what uh, this, uh, the unaccountable medical board that was put into place uh, is trying to do. And that, that would be one of its functions. Um, and yet y you don't really see the, cri the confidence in this sort of business. And you almost wonder, you know, you kind of wonder is, uh, is this part of, and I think this is the opening for your book, that maybe there is this sort of at least beginning to rethink what's going on here. But at the same time, we still have the massive entitlement system that no one really seems to want to give up outside of, you know, even, even the Tea Party seems kind of hesitant here. So I, I, there is that sort of opening. Um, another question I wanted to, to ask you is, you know, why was America, and I think this when I hear the progressive thesis, why was America open uh, to to the progressive movement, it seems that we it did largely achieve its its goals uh, not not quickly, but over the course of generations. Well, I think I would start with uh, the Nobel laureate uh, Frederick Hayek, uh, who really I think uh, kind of opened our eyes to the problems of bureaucracy and freedom. Uh, um, and he said the great superstition of the 20th century uh, is the superstition uh, of science being able to solve all of human problems. Uh, and with the rise of success in science, which really doesn't get very systematic on practical problems until uh, the late 19th century, all of these ideas... Uh, uh, the change uh, America and the world uh, come together at this time. Uh, uh, so once science looks like, hey, it can take care of things uh, like bacteria in a practical way and chemistry, uh, um, we start to think it can do everything. Uh, uh, and I said, you know, when people look back at the 20th century, uh, the thing that's going to surprise them most is the superstitious idea they have uh, that science could solve everything. Hayek's great insight uh, was the complexity uh, of the human nature compared to physical nature and how even if science was as uh, <clears throat> absolute as it claimed to be in the physical world, which it wasn't, and he dealt with that too in different places, but... Even if it was, a, a, this is back in the 1930s or 40s, he wrote a piece called... Uh, 1948, uh, I think, is uh, the piece you're referring to, The Use of right, Knowledge uh, in a Society. Yeah. Right, uh, which he says there are about 10 to the, the 56 uh, power atoms in the solar system, and yet there are more intercordial interactions in one person playing the, uh, than 10 to the <coughs> 56 power uh, 
uh, and uh, uh, that's just one person brain in uh, a few minutes, and you multiply that by uh, how many hours in a day, days in a week, in a year, or, and then start adding in uh, uh, 300 million people they're dealing with, or 3 billion people they're dealing with. Uh, uh, to expect that science that might be able to... Uh, to work on atoms, which, by the way, we're still finding more and more out of all the time. Uh, we, uh, science hasn't even solved the problem of the atom, much less uh, of human nature. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's this profound misunderstanding uh, of how complex uh, human nature is uh, and the simplistic ability uh, uh, trying to uh, have a bureaucracy solve all these problems. Uh, and then you come out in the practical effect of Obamacare, which is just an absolute uh, catastrophe. Uh, uh, the president keeps changing it by administrative decision almost literally every day. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it just undermines the... Uh, the whole program, and it's just total chaos, and their only hope is to get past this next election, uh, and maybe something else could happen. Uh, uh, so I just think that the Obamacare clearly shows the breakdown, and of course you have even the popular programs, which in some way do some good, like Social Security and Medicare, their unfunded liabilities are unbelievable. Uh, we count about uh, 15 billion uh, a trillion uh, uh, in formal debt. Well, that doesn't count three trillion more at the Federal Reserve, or <coughs> eight trillion more in Social Security, or an incredible 38 trillion in Medicare. I mean, this can't go on. I mean. This kind of obligation, is, uh, when we can't even talk about doing even half serious things, oh, yeah. the most radical program uh, uh, by uh, Congressman um, yeah, Paul uh, Ryan, Paul Ryan, uh, uh, you know, doesn't change anything for ten years. We can't even talk about that in rational terms. Yes. Yeah. No. I and I think that. I mean, that's. Yeah. Uh, and I want to get into you know, really the, the heart of your book and this idea of freedom and tradition and, and the fusion there. But this, you actually raise, I think, a fundamental question, which is, uh, do you see yourself possessing the freedom, you know, to reform yourself, to actually reform your appetites, to restrain yourself, to actually say no to yourself? Uh, is this is this even possible within the American Republic? And that's, you know, I mean, that's a question we can think about, but uh, that that's, that's certainly a, a distressing thing. I want to, you're in the book, you, you build in terms of, you know, America's way back and, you know, thinking about freedom and tradition in the American political experience. You build on what is called the fusionist tradition um, that Frank Meyer prominently articulated. Uh, this is now contained in a set of essays entitled What is in, in Defense of Freedom that Liberty Fund Publishes. Uh, uh, talk about fusionism here and, and what he was trying uh, to do. Well, actually, what he's trying to do is to go back and look at what was Western civilization uh, uh, and to find out what elements about Western civilization were what made it great. Uh, and uh, Meyer is normally considered a libertarian. He gives great emphasis to uh, freedom being what's so different about the West from the rest of the world. But he also says that but freedom alone has no meaning. Freedom just means free. Uh, uh, it has to have concrete representations uh, of what that means, uh, you know, such as the separation of powers, uh, uh, which is probably the most important political uh, idea and what very much separates uh, the West. But also simple things about morality, ideas about uh, stealing, uh, ideas about uh, family. Uh, um, uh, Western society comes up with the idea of the nuclear family. Everything before that was the extended family. It wasn't until 
the early church started uh, trying to limit uh, uh, family arranged marriages uh, and using it for political advantage. Uh, uh, these things, they weren't planned to create a capitalist society or even necessarily a free one, but, but they threw these acts over a long period of time. <coughs> <laughs> created a, a, a system that was both free and based on a strong uh, tradition uh, of morality, and he comes to the conclusion you need both. And interestingly, Hayek, uh, who, as I say, is normally considered the libertarian, uh, the top uh, libertarian organization and uh, institute in Washington uh, names their main hall after him. And yet he says the paradox of history is that a free society will always also be a tradition-based society. And that's because freedom by itself just leads to chaos. It, ha it needs a tradition to form it. And Hayek was one of the first in modern times I traced uh, this back uh, to the rise of Christianity, even though he didn't even believe in God, much less be a Christian. Uh, but he recognized that it was this history that formed the basis for the traditions and beliefs uh, that allowed capitalism to arise. So, so what Meyer does is he goes back and looks and tries to reestablish that base. Uh, and really, Hayek does the same thing. Uh, in a much more academic and philosophical way. Uh, um, and it really was the motivating idea of the, the modern conservative movement. We forget the Republican Party not that long ago was the home of progressivism. Uh, the New Republic, uh, the most pro important progressive magazine of the day, uh, was Republican-oriented. Um, uh, so... Really, Hayek and, and Meyer and a lot of other creative people in the 40s, 50s uh, started looking back to find out what did we do before progressivism messed it up. Uh, and they looked back and they found this tra tradition, uh, 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 tradition of tradition and freedom uh, as both being central. Uh, and the argument that it's not a, a rationalistic ideology that you start from one first principle and deduct everything from it. No, the, at the social level, there are at least two prime uh, principles, both freedom and tradition, and both of them, uh, uh, you have to weigh one against the other. Uh, thinking is much more complex, uh, the same as uh, social behavior is... Uh, than most uh, of modern uh, philosophy uh, would accept that it is. Uh, I want to uh, just kind of try and unpack some of what you said. So for Meyer, uh, he writes, and you, and you quote him, you know, freedom uh, is, you know, I think, really the means, the rationality uh, to your ends, but tradition provides the energy and the goals. Talk about what, what Meyer meant there, uh, because I, I, I'm curious to understand tradition provides the energy and the goals uh, to which freedom then, you know, provides rationality and means. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very complex thing, uh, and Meyer himself kind of half threw up his arms uh, through it, uh, uh, because it's very complex to try to see precisely why uh, do you need this certain kind of tradition to support freedom? I mean, empirically, to me, it's pretty easy to look at. I come from an empirical political science background. Uh, I mean, the free countries do tend to be people that had uh, this kind of Western, uh, Greek, uh, Roman, uh, Judaic, Christian uh, background. Uh, so, you can see that's what happened. Exactly, you know, connecting all the threads is not so easy. Uh, uh, but clearly, it happened uh, empirically, uh, and uh, that's the best argument I can give for it. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I think, you know, as, as I'm reading your book, I mean, there's a couple of things out there in my mind. And, you know, one is just the response of uh, a lot of libertarian theorists that I've seen uh, to the idea, the very idea of tradition. Uh, and thinking, so, how, you know, how do we know what should be in our tradition? And maybe that's, that's a good question. What is, what is tradition in the American political experience? Um, and, and that, you know, to the extent there is tradition, it's, it's to be open and to be experimental and that this is exactly what market capitalism requires. And so really our tradition is something like, you know, freely contracting individuals making their own values. And so I'm just, I'm just trying to understand that sort of, because I, I, I think there's something very valuable in this idea of, of freedom and tradition. We could say freedom and responsibility as we do at Liberty Fund. Leo Strauss talked about liberty and virtue. Uh, and, and the great books movement initially had that understanding. And so I'm just trying to to figure that out when, a, you know, a claim might be laid down. Well, actually, it's it's the self-sovereignty of the individual uh, and, and his freedom uh, to make choices subject to whatever consequences may be. But but that, of course, brings in, I think, an understanding of uh, an anthropological understanding of of something that is, uh, you know, potentially unsteady or you know unbalanced uh, because you actually think that you yourself create value you're almost godlike in what you're able to do yeah well i mean that is the 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 problem in western civilization that i mean really western civilization invents the idea of the individual uh, 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 that the final goal is is not a, a communal institution, but the individual. Uh, uh, I mean, it it it, it it's in parts uh, of uh, Athens and parts uh, of the, the Hebrew tradition. Uh, um, you see the individual standing up against the state, but it's a it's a very weak idea. It isn't really till Christianity that uh, the, the individual is the part. I mean, uh, probably the critical social thing was when uh, uh, Paul convinced Peter that uh, they don't have to be subject to uh, uh, a group uh, uh, moral traditions, uh, but it's based on the individual uh, and this individual and and, and uh, this would really come out of the t- the incarnation. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and Jesus' teaching, you know, you go at the one lost sheep, uh, uh, the yeah. prodigal son. I mean, it's so individualistic and so different from any other uh, 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 social thinking uh, uh, at the time, or even since uh, rising in different. But but this idea of the individual being the the center of making it, and it's not the tribe or the group or the state, uh, um, that creates problems. Uh, I mean, the the danger is that that ego takes over and you know, turns into Nietzsche, Superman, or in concrete form Hitler or Stalin. Uh, uh, once that individual idea gets it, it's so powerful uh, uh, that it can go to excess, and that's why you need the other parts of tradition to calm it down. Uh, ideas like family and uh, community, uh, uh, these things, uh, as long as they're free, uh, uh, but they have a tremendous weight and ability to offset these uh, potentially very dangerous uh, elements uh, of individualism. Uh, uh, and, it, and it is that individualism which is so creative and so dynamic and, and changes the world uh, uh, that, that it needs something to restrain it or it goes to the total individualism uh, uh, of every person uh, uh, Thinking uh, they are uh, Superman. Uh, uh, as I'm reading your book, I, I mean, I'm you know obviously what what looms out there is is the American right. I think, and I think within your book, an implicit criticism uh, that it went wrong uh, at some point. Um, uh, so I mean, we can we can we can talk about the Bush presidency, the second Bush presidency, 
Um, but the, there is, I think, something like fusionism seems to have been left behind. And maybe a good question is, was, was Meyer's fusion project uh, practically of, of great use, but, but theoretically uh, very shallow? Uh, and, and that's one criticism that's been leveled against it, it, it or, the, or to say it worked very well in a Cold War context uh, and, and the standpoint of an external enemy, uh, an existential enemy that could unite a lot of different groups. But now uh, uh, maybe maybe it's it's not so valuable. So I, I'd be interested to get your response on that. Well, the best response I can give is uh, by Alan Carson, which is uh, he wrote a blurb from my book, uh, and he said he long believed the fusionist uh, conservative Meyer made for splendid politics, uh, but for poor and incoherent political philosophy. <laughs> and he says, my book, uh, America's Way Back, forces me to reconsider. Divine argues persuasively that the synthesis of traditional Western values with individual human freedom has intellectual and moral integrity as the foundation for ordered liberty. Now, uh, some of the change there in mind, especially <laughs> a great intellectual like Alan, uh, that, that to me was a highlight of writing the book. Uh, um, it can be seen, uh, you know, it was right for its time, uh, and it was. Uh, but the fact is, as we move further away from it, uh, the right itself becomes incoherent. Uh, 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 you know, to, there certainly was no deep understanding of individualism among either of the uh, the Bushes, uh, and certainly not uh, the second one. Uh, uh, he, he's one of his famous phrases is, "If anyone hurts, the government has to act." Now, that's not the idea of limited government and individual responsibility. Uh, and communal behavior, uh, uh, we've gone away from those ideas, um, uh, and and they can't really be done artificially. If you don't have a passion for, or at least to have some small group uh, uh, in, in the leadership that, that that understands you need both sides of this equation. Uh, once you take freedom be, to be an end rather than a means, you, you, you distorted the whole idea of what freedom is about. Uh, if you think that freedom means, uh, you know, open uh, lifestyles, for example, uh, uh, that means you're going to form social policies to come to that conclusion. Uh, uh, Freedom has to be considered as a means of allowing opportunity and people to make uh, their own decisions, uh, which will be based on some tradition, of which freedom is a tradition, too. Uh, yeah. But the, the, the concept of means and ends uh, is very important, uh, important to both Hayek and Meyer. Uh, and uh, I think we've gone away from it. And... and you go back to the Constitution. I mean, what the Constitution did, it, it probably didn't work at all out in theoretic, theoretical form, but by summing it up in the, the Tenth Amendment, uh, the power is not given to the national government, which were few. Uh, uh, the rest are for the states, uh, the people, uh, uh, privately. Uh, now, they gave a limited number of functions to the Fed because they knew if you divided power, I mean, in this sense, uh, uh, Wilson was right, uh, if you divide power, it's much more difficult to get things done efficiently. But the founders were wise enough to realize that if you don't divide power, uh, you're going to uh, have tyranny or at least abuses. Um, so they only gave it a few things to do. The problem today is we've given the federal government so many things to do it can't do. The top public administration official, and he's not a conservative or a libertarian by any stretch of the nation, uh, Paul Leiter, professor at the New York University, uh, 
was that bureaucracy has so overwhelmed the government, and quoting from the Constitution, it can no longer faithfully execute its laws. Now, this is an objective statement about it, that we've so mired it down that it can't uh, do anything. And I was the head of that institution for four years. Uh, I mean, it just cannot do it. There's no way somebody in the middle of this bureaucracy in some enormous building in Washington has some secret way of knowing all this. Thing. I always talk in my speeches about the Wizard of Oz is kind of, I think, the, the perfect American story. Uh, you have the, this girl uh, from Kansas who is thrown into this unfamiliar place, and immediately she wants to find some enormous powerful figure to save her from this. So he goes down the yellow brick road and looks for this great wizard that's supposed to solve all the problems. She picks up uh, someone who wants a brain from this guy, uh, someone who wants courage from this uh, intellect. Uh, I mean, this great thing is going to give you everything. She finally gets to the Emerald Palace and sees uh, this great thing, gets in and this great statue talking in deep tones about how uh, they can deliver the things uh, they want. And, and Dorothy looks over and she sees uh, the curtain uh, is open on the side. It's a little old man uh, who has a machine that makes his voice sound more powerful. Uh, that is the only thing behind the wizard. <laughs> and that's the same with the national government. It, it, it's a powerful-looking thing, but it can't do anything right. And if Obamacare can't convince people, nobody can. Nothing can. Yeah, no, I, I, I think uh, I mean, the the regulatory problems, the the morass. The, I mean, the, the, there's nothing really there. Um, and yet, uh, and, and yet, it's it is there, and it is a huge problem. And, and the government, as you you document, has grown dramatically in terms of spending a portion of GDP and the sheer amount of regulations that have come out uh, during the Bush presidency as well as Obama's presidency. Um, you would know, think, uh, you know, just think about the American right. I mean, it, the dominant thrust, of, you know, the Cold War. It seems to me the most powerful group where it was the neoconservative element, uh, and they had, I think, really good domestic social policy objectives in terms of limiting government, they, but they weren't afraid to nationalize things, or at least argue for nationalizing things, and this really, I think, helps us think about uh, the freedom and tradition, because a huge part of our tradition is the structural constraint on government and federalism. Uh, we've been talking some about, I think, separation of powers being jettisoned, uh, particularly openly uh, by this president in, 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 in the last year, but particularly in his, some of his comments recently. Uh, but federalism is a structural constraint designed to elevate the liberty of the individual. And that seems to be returning as a way to deal with certain problems. Uh, I mean, uh, drug legalization, maybe that's how we're going to handle it. Uh, uh, Same-sex marriage, maybe if the Supreme Court will let it happen, that's the way we can handle it. Uh, but then there's also this competition, real fiscal competition between states that's opened up, uh, which is really... Uh, uh, something that's, uh, uh, I mean, kind of unique in the sense of, you know, to see 25 or 26 states sue the federal government uh, in alliance with one another against certain of its policies, that certainly hasn't happened in a while. And so it, it does seem there's, there's kind of a revival of thinking here. You know, it's kind of the only thing left uh, is going back to what the Constitution uh, said. I mean, federalism is the central principle uh, and, and Ronald Reagan was really high on this. He would always uh, talk about that. Uh, and you know, that's one thing a lot of conservatives don't recognize on freedom, too. Freedom is individual, and that's uh, what gives it its dynamism. But it's also free institutions. Uh, uh, some uh, libertarians complain uh, about... Uh, uh, I had... Uh, a friend of mine, a very libertarian guy, who complained about uh, all the restrictions passed uh, in a community uh, near where he lived. And I said, uh, well, uh, what is it? Oh, they tell you what color to paint the door. They tell you uh, when you, how long the grass has to be, and uh, all on and on like that. And I said, well, what kind of place is it? And he told me uh, where it was. And I said, so that's a, 
a homeowners association. Uh, that's a private solution. Nobody has to go there. And so, well, I guess you're kind of right there. I mean, uh, yeah. looking at freedom as being like you can do anything you want, I mean, that doesn't take into account there are other people. Uh, uh, it was an interesting. Uh, I just want to say it was an interesting part of your book as well on this on this thread that uh, with the way the way uh, progressivism uh, launched with the the codes and the zoning codes, but also preventing uh, new towns from being formed, new counties from being formed, uh, the kind of the rationalization, the centralization of local government, the consolidated counties. I thought that I mean, that's just something I haven't really thought much about, uh, but yet it makes sense and it's. It's particularly devastating if, you know, if we think about the tradition of, of civic associations and how that really gives form to our freedom to actually do things you know, in alliance with others and groups to achieve whatever local common objectives we might have. And, and, that's kind of, and, that, and this, this sort of process of consolidation uh, militates against that, which is you know, if, if Tocqueville is right about centralization and democracy, uh, that's a huge problem. Uh, and that's... That's something we don't really think too much about, and it, it could even explain why we can't say no, maybe, to the regulatory state, uh, because we really, we're just so bereft now of those local arts of association. We really can't conceive of ourselves doing things apart from uh, large central directives. Yeah, no, I mean, and even what we think of local government really isn't local government. It's much too large. The progressives understood this. They stopped the development of municipalities uh, and move the local government functions to counties. Now, in, in the metropolitan areas, the counties are as bad bureaucratic as the national government. Uh, not quite as bad. Cause, but, but we need to break down the, this... Uh, uh, I'm having a... I, mean, I can't think of the... What's his name? The guy who was uh, mayor of... Uh, Indianapolis, and then Deputy Oh, oh yeah, yeah, uh, Stephen uh, Stephen Goldsmith or Goldsmith. Goldsmith, right. I mean, he had this idea of municipal federalism. That to me is it, and he he tried it in both places uh, in Indianapolis and New York. Of course, the unions just fought him yeah. to uh, standstill. Although he got a couple of things accomplished. You know, his account places. of New York was every good idea he had was uh, no, no, that's that's prohibited by a consent decree. That's prohibited by this right. contract, et cetera. It's kind of depressing. Yeah, and, you know, it's that idea of local government, I mean, that is so important. And I think that's probably the most difficult thing for conservatives, libertarians to get over, is that government, you need government. I mean, that is a fact. It annoys me when the progressives always say conservatives don't, and some of them don't. But most know you need government. You need some kind of way of governing. Now, I want a private one where the people can make their decisions to live. And if you have enough local governments, they can make you paint your door. You can just move across the street. Uh, uh, which this guy did, the, the libertarian I was talking about. The idea, I think, is so powerful by two great intellectuals, uh, uh, a guy named T. Walt, and um, uh, I'm forgetting names today, but anyway, they came up with the thing of a market of local governments. I mean, the, the same way we have a market of private corporations, and by the way, corporations are not individuals, all right? Uh, so uh, the market, especially the larger part, but even the smaller uh, uh, elements are rarely there's more uh, partnerships and individual, uh, or at least uh, there's more money in them. Uh, uh, the market, uh, the economic market is made up of institutions, uh, and we have to think more about uh, government being made up of institution and a market and the idea that you allow people free access. I mean, it's too much to say you don't like what's going on in the United States. Well, you got to move to Zimbabwe or someplace. Uh, I mean, <laughs> but asking somebody to move next door or around the corner across the block, uh, that's not unreasonable. Uh, 
And as long as you have some higher authorities that don't allow confiscation of property or doing it, invidious times of discrimination and contract. Uh, I mean, that should be our model. And interestingly, I do find that people are doing it. Tom Colburn is retiring from the Senate, I think, uh, from Oklahoma. Just, I think, one of the best people that's ever been in that body and, and certainly is there now. He's partially retiring because he has uh, some cancer, but he, he, he says in his, he's doing a bunch of interviews now. Uh, he's saying it's just as much that he, he, he's come to the conclusion you just cannot make changes that will make a difference in Washington. He says we've got to go back and, and look at uh, the federalism that made uh, America great. We've got to get these things to, to make America work. We've got to get things back to states and local and private. That is the only way out of this bureaucratic morass that we, I mean, that Wilson set out specifically to create. It's not like this was an error. They set out to do this, and now we see the results of it. Uh, it can't operate. It, it's uh, the little putting, uh, putting uh, Gulliver uh, uh, with millions of, of little bounds uh, stop you from being able to do anything. Uh, that has got to be uh, our model, uh, economic markets and government markets. Uh, 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 it, 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 we, we need to take, uh, and you know, I think that is getting, I, I heard the, uh, Rand Paul, who actually read my book, uh, I think he understands this. Uh, uh, I've heard uh, Ted Cruz do the, something similar. I have uh, this guy uh, Lee from, uh, Senator Lee from um, Mike Lee Utah. From Utah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think this, if you believe in freedom uh, uh, and uh, individual responsibility. I think this is the only place you can go today. We're we're trapped with what we have. Uh, kind of, I, I think uh, the end state bargain of this thing should be uh, all right. Medicare and Social Security uh, they're too difficult to change. Uh, let, let's put them in Article One, Section Eight, uh, as things the federal government can do. Hopefully, re to solve it uh, uh, in a more rational way. But accept reality. But then let the rest of the stuff the national government does that isn't in Article One, Section Eight, get that back where it belongs uh, to the states, to the local governments, uh, and private sector. Uh, uh, it would be constitutional. Uh, you could put in the, this amendment uh, that adds uh, Social Security and Medicare to uh, the, uh, Article One, Section 8 of the Constitution. You, you could put in the final section is, and we really mean the Tenth Amendment. Uh, uh, now, that's partially a joke, but it's also, I think it's the only way to go, sooner or later. Uh, I mean, we only have three choices. I mean, either we keep going along the way we are, and we're headed for bankruptcy. There's no way we can pay off Medicare uh, without making major changes in it. Uh, um, uh, second, do what the progressives have brought. Right from the beginnings, from Wilson to Gara Meridal, all of the great progressives have said the problem, why we can't do this better, is we don't have enough power. You've got to give us more power. Get rid of all these divisions of power. All right, so we either keep going the same way, give the progressives what they really want, let's give one uh, legislative body uh, all the power uh, over courts and uh, executive uh, government, uh, uh, local governments, give it all the power. Uh, or third, go back to the way the Constitution is supposed to operate with a few limited things it's supposed to do and the rest state, local, or, or private. Uh, I think those are the only three alternatives, and I think the good news for conservatives uh, and libertarians uh, is that pe people now see the danger of going one, the way we're going. 
And two, they've always seen the danger of giving all that. But they don't want unitary power all in one place so a, a chancellor can make the decision. Uh, so the, the, the only other option is what made America great, what is the underlying idea of the Constitution, a few powers to the national, give the rest to the states, to the people individually. Uh, I don't see any fourth way. Don, I think uh, I think with that we've we've really come full circle in the sense that we you've you're, you've brought brought us back to the question we started with, which is uh, uh, the crisis that America is in, and the crisis meaning a fundamental decision has to be made uh, one way or the other. Uh, we've we've been talking with Donald Devine, the author of America's Way Back: Reclaiming Freedom, Tradition, and the Constitution. Donald, thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you. Uh, it's been fun, Richard. Appreciate it. This is your host, Richard Reinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, and find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org.